life going through, it'll be, it's mm-hmm. okay. It's okay. It takes people a minute to get on there anyway, so it's fine. What? That's my ankle. Oh. Oh, okay. <laughs> all our knuckles. We'll get all ready for the message. <laughs> I'm just gonna stretch. Gotta stretch. I'm gonna stretch. Bend and stretch. <laughs> Bend and snap. <laughs> Bend and snap, <laughs> yep. Here we are. <laughs> da, 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 intermission music. I saw that. It's fun. It's fun. It was fun. Yes, yes. It's very much fun. I wish that the light was pointed at you right now <laughs> so that everybody could be in on the fun. I'm just figuring out how I want things. Okay. Okay, Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for the message, and we thank you for Sunday. We thank you for the day that we can all come together, and we can do this. We thank you for our services, and we ask that you would bless us all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, the long-awaited message today is, welcome to the Black Parade. We need a G. <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. dun, 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 dun. We better not do that because it might cut us off. Okay, so I cut off the sound for a few minutes. Anyway, for those who do not know the song Welcome to the Black Parade, I'm going to give you all a comparison. But here we go, shirt, sweatshirt, shirt, all compliments of Hot Topic. Um, have a tribute to My Chemical Romance is Welcome to the Black Parade. For those who are here who don't know the song, we're gonna play it at the end. For those who are watching who don't know the song, I put it on the Facebook page for Sanctuary, so you can go and see what I'm talking about because I've noticed that there's definitely a cutoff that people who are maybe over 45 or so don't know the song. So, in order to kind of give an idea of what we're going to talk about today for those who are over 45, I've made a comparison between it and another song. Now, there are some differences that I will clarify. But so we're all on the same page with what we're starting. Nobody start humming it, once again, if you know it, because it will cut off our audio. But in the 1960s, there was a song written by a then very little known folk artist named Bob Dylan, who did a song called The Times They Are Changing. And the lyrics for those who are under 45, I mean, I'm under 45, but I know the song. You might know it if you hear it. Come gather around people wherever you roam and admit that the waters around you have grown. And accept that it's that accept it that soon you'll be drenched to the bone if your time to you is worth saving. And you better start swimming or you'll sink like a stone for the times they are changing. Come writers and critics who prophesize with your pen. And keep your eyes wide, the chance won't come again. And don't speak too soon for the wheel's still in spin. And there's no telling who that it's naming, for the loser now will be later to win, for the times they are changing. Come senators, congressmen, please heed the call. Don't stand in the doorway, don't block up the hall. For he that gets hurt will be he who has stalled. The battle outside raging will soon shake your windows and rattle your walls, for the times they are changing. Come mothers and fathers throughout the land, and don't criticize what you can't understand. Your sons and your daughters are beyond your command. Your old road is rapidly aging. Please get out of the new one if you can't lend your hand for the times they are changing. The line it is drawn, the curse it is cast, the slow one now will later be fast. As the present now will later be past, the order is rapidly fading, and the first one now will later be last for the times they are changing. So, I will post that on the sanctuary page for those who don't know that. 
But since we have intergenerational people that listen to me and that follow our stuff, I'm trying to make it so we're all on the same page. So what the Black Parade and Dylan have in common, so what these two songs have in common is that we're talking about kind of the changing of times, the changing of cycles. Now, Welcome to the Black Parade is different because it is a son talking to his father, passing the torch. In other words, that things are coming around and there will be one day when I'm not here anymore, which death is a very, very strong facet in Welcome to the Black Parade. It is very much an underlying theme, but we're gonna tie that in in a minute. Versus Dylan's is more of a rebel song. It's more of people coming against past generations and fighting. In other words, this was the 1960s. Everything is changing. Our parents don't understand us. We need to fight it. But you better get with things because the times they are changing. So the difference is that Black Parade is I'm not going to be here anymore. Things are going to change and you need to look at yourself and accept where you are in this particular battle because there is going to come a time when you have to stand up and you have to decide what you're going to do. So we are not going to read all the lyrics in Welcome to the Black Parade because there are a lot of them. But in order to kind of make the parallel where we kind of see what's going on and then I'm going to read from a section at the end. When I was a young boy, my father took me into the city to see a marching band. He said, son, when you grow up, would you be the savior of the broken, the beaten, and the damned? He said, will you defeat them, your demons, and all the non-believers, the plans that they have made, because one day I'll leave you a phantom to lead you in the summer to join the Black Parade. So, let's bring all this stuff together and let's make nice scriptural parallels. We're at a time where I think it's pretty much generally understood that we understand that church as we understand it doesn't get it. Okay. And this has been a battle that I think has been going on for a long time. I think that I would say it probably started somewhere between the 80s and today. It's probably more around the turn of, this, of the centuries where I would put it is somewhere around 2000 that we really started to get the message and to see that church doesn't get it. It doesn't get where people are at. It's not getting the needs that they have. It seems like the only things that really seem to work in church are fundraisers on TV. So in other words, they'll have big, huge things and people will sing and people will come out and they'll raise money for TVN or they'll raise money for this or they'll raise money for that. And people will give and people will give thinking they're going to get a return on that. There have been all sorts of different fundraisers that I kind of remember seeing around that time. Oh, send us $1,000 and we'll pray over your debt. Okay, look, if I'm in debt, I don't have $1,000 to send you, but, you know, okay. Or, you know, do this and send us this money and send us a specific amount and we'll send you a picture of your loved one and we'll pray for them to get saved. Or, you know, we started with a lot of the gimmicky stuff really started to come up in these particular eras. You know, people will say, all right, send us this and we'll send you holy water from Chernobyl. Or, you know, we'll send you anointing oil from something. I don't know, from olives. Okay, I don't know what it's all from. I was going to say from grapes, but I was going to go, no, wait, that's juice. That's not all. Okay. But when we started to see a lot of gimmicks, and it seemed like for a little while that people really bought into the gimmicks, people still buy into the gimmicks. There are people. Maybe not as many, but there are still people buying in the gimmicks. But it started to seem like church became this big gimmick. And we stopped dealing with life. We stopped dealing with people's grief. We stopped dealing with feelings. We stopped dealing with the black parade. We stopped dealing with the darkness. And what wound up happening is we have all these people now that are kind of, we would say, fit in the black parade. If you watch the black parade, they're different. They're odd, they're unusual. Maybe they got issues or they got thoughts or they got stuff that doesn't fit in with mainline church and where mainline church is at. Maybe they just don't buy into the, oh, well, you know, be blessed and highly favored or, you know, I'm too blessed to be stressed or this, that or something else. So we kind of start putting all this stuff together and you have this entire group of people that really don't fit in in the world, that really don't have a place in society but church, as we understand it, really hasn't made the way for them. So how does this relate to what we're talking about today? So in Zechariah 
through seven. In the NIV, it says, this is what the Lord my God says, pasture the flock mark for slaughter. Their buyers slaughter them and go unpunished. Those who sell them say, praise the Lord, I am rich. Their own shepherds do not spare them. For I will no longer have pity on the people of the land, declares the Lord. I will hand everyone over to his neighbor and his king. They will oppress the land and I will not rescue them from their hands. So I pastured the flock mark for slaughter, particularly the oppressed of the flock. Then I took two, took two staffs and called one favor and the other union and I pastured the flock. Now I'm stopping there because this is actually a very complex passage. But the story of this is I was still in school, so this is some years back. I don't even think I was 20 years old yet. And God gave me Zechariah 11:4 to shepherd the flock marked for slaughter. That's how it reads in the King James, was to shepherd the flock marked for slaughter. And I didn't really understand what that meant at the time. But when I think of the Black Parade, I think of the shepherd, the flock that's marked for slaughter. And I think of the flock that's marked for slaughter because it's saying here that their own shepherds didn't take care of them. Their own leaders didn't answer their questions. Their own people rejected them and marked them for something that would make it so that they would be targeted to be destroyed or for destruction. How many of us have been in church where they say, if you fall anywhere on the queer spectrum, that you're going to hell? They don't ask any questions. They don't half the time even know what they're talking about. They just reiterate something that they heard somewhere else. How many times have we been in churches where people just throw people over because and say they're going to hell for this, that, or something else, whatever the reason is, and that they're not redeemable? Now, I was in a church that I actually assisted the leadership of, and this is how we kind of got here in 2013 in an apostolic church down in Southeast Raleigh, down off Creech Road. We had church down there, and somebody came as a guest. And now I really want to mark that this person was a guest. I didn't know her very well. She kept trying to hang around me. She kept trying to attach herself to me. And her and her mom and her husband and her daughter, somebody, I don't know, some relative, some, it was a kid, I don't remember what it was. Anyway, it was there, it's not important. And she called me the next day, complaining about the church. And she said, well, I sensed over some of the men that were there that there was a homosexual spirit over them. Now, we're going to, for the sake of accuracy, clarify to the entire world that there is no such thing as a homosexual spirit. It is not a biblical concept, but it is something a lot of people do talk about and they do teach about. And she said to me that that's a dark place and you need to not be there because there's no redemption and there's no help for any of them. And my response to her was, well, the Bible says that the Spirit of God hovers in dark places. So who are you, first of all, to come and tell me where I ought to be? And second of all, who are you to not read the Bible and understand that sometimes when we are in specific places, that, and it was a dark place, but it had nothing to do with anybody's spirit or anybody being gay or anybody being anything. It was a dark place where I was at at that time, and it had to do with the church that we were at and the people who own the church. But who are you to come and tell me where God can or cannot be or what God can or cannot do? And that's exactly what happened here in Zechariah is that people decided that somebody was marked for slaughter. That in other words, they were not worthy of redemption. They were not going to be able to be helped. And so they didn't do anything to help them to get where they needed to be. They didn't empower them. They didn't recognize what they were supposed to be doing in their life. They didn't give them anything for it. And instead of that, they oppressed the people. So we've been talking every now and then it comes up in sanctuary, the difference between oppression and depression. The difference between those two things is oppression comes from without and depression comes from within. And now you can be depressed because you are oppressed. They can kind of work together. They can be things that work at the same time. But that what we see here in Zechariah is that the people were so depraved and that things were so bad at this particular time in history that even the shepherds, even the spiritual leaders who were sent to these people decided that they were not worth redeeming. And that's exactly what's happened today. 
And it's not just one particular situation. It's anybody that doesn't fit in to the church mold of 2.3 children and a white picket fence and being young and being married and having a disposable income and driving an SUV and being a soccer mom and whatever else it is that fits and being heterosexual and cisgender norm. If you don't fit into all those categories and that leaves out an awful lot of people, that leaves out single people, it leaves out people on the queer spectrum. It leaves out people who are older. It leaves out single parents and divorcees and widows and anybody who's over a certain age. And so all those people in church are left for slaughter. There's no teaching for them. There's no information for them. There's no education for them. There's no calling for them. Unless you know you want to be single for the Lord until you go to the mixer that they have and find your spouse finally, okay? We have to assign everything. There is nothing offered to any of these groups. So they're done. They're ready to be slaughtered. They're there. And in the process, things don't work. Things just don't work. It even talks about in Zechariah that the people actually even oppressed him that he was supposed to be going to help because things were so that bad. And actually, that is a thing that does happen sometimes, that God may assign us or bring us to people, and because they have been treated so badly by church that they don't see the assignment for what it is, and they reject it. So that is a thing even in this, even though we're not going to talk about this. But what I'm going to say is that this is pre-Jesus. This is pre-New Testament. So pretty much, in other words, the flock detested him, and he had to walk away. But what does God tell us? Well, let's go over to Matthew because the story is not over. And I love how we're both coming from very similar passages. Matthew 21. So the story's not over. It's not hopeless. So let's say you've been marked and you're there in the black parade and you don't really have anywhere to go or any place to be because you don't fit in. Because it just doesn't work the way that it is. And the slaughtering connects to this kind of concept because as we talked about, death can have more than one association. So black parade is very, very obviously about death and about confronting death. In fact, as we talked about when we were looking for it, I'm going down the lyrics and we get to the part, sometimes I get the feeling she's watching over me and I'm going, who is she? Who is she in the story? Because this is the guy and his father and there's sheep and then she appears. It turns out it's a reference to his grandmother who is dead. So there is a lot of reference to death in here, but there's even death in the times they are changing because we can have the death of ideas. So the Bible talks about things being cyclical and about things coming around and that within cycles we have seasons and so cycles are divided up basically into seasons and they're understood that way because as long as there is the earth there will be seed time and harvest there will be cold in winter there will be seasons that follow so the natural pattern is following a spiritual pattern it's following something that's in there that's deeper and that's in more of an eternal concept it's like we were talking about before we went on and we were speaking this morning that the things that we go through are a type or are what we would call a microcosm of a macrocosm that everything that we're going through is part of this bigger battle it's something that's bigger it's something eternal so the black parade represents paradigm shift it represents the end of a cycle and the start of a new one and the old cycle doesn't understand it just like in dylan's the time they are changing the older generation the older people don't understand what's going on now and I don't necessarily think it's even an age thing. There are some very, very young people caught up in some very, very bad ideas nowadays. I don't necessarily think that it's all generational, but that it is kind of in a spiritual sense, spiritual generation, that things are changing. And that's the hope for those that don't seem to have a place or the hope for those that don't seem to have the lead. Because what Jesus says over here, starting in verse 33, 
Matthew 21, listen to another parable. There was a landowner who planted a vineyard. He put a wall around it, dug a wine press in it, and built a watchtower. Then he rented the vineyard to some farmers and went away on a journey. When the harvest time approached, he sent his servants to the tenants to collect his fruit. The tenants seized his servants. They beat one, killed another, and stoned a third. Then he sent other servants to them more than the first time, and the tenants treated them the same way. Last of all, he sent his son to them. They will respect my son, he said. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to each other, This is the heir. Come, let's kill him and take his inheritance. So they took him and threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. Therefore, when the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do to those tenants? He will bring those wretches to a wretched and they replied, and he will rent the vineyard to other tenants who will give him his share of the profit the harvest time. Jesus said to them, have you never read in the scriptures? The stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and this is marvelous in our eyes. Now this passage here is really kind of important because I looked up stone, that word stone in the Greek, and it actually is a reference to a millstone or a stumbling block. So in other words, the builders or the people who are already there are rejecting the stones because they stumble on them. They can't figure out where they go in the building. It's not an obvious stone that you go, yes, you're going to go here or yes, you're going to go here or yes, you're going to fit in with what we already have. They're pieces that you kind of have to maneuver. And as a result, people trip on them. They're stumbling. They're heavy. They're a cause for something that maybe they have questions that the shepherds can't answer. Maybe they have issues that people don't get or don't know how to handle. Maybe it's an angle or a perspective that people just don't understand. But it says that the stone that the builders reject becomes the capstone or the foundational stone that relates to building. So it becomes essential. The stumbling block becomes the essential foundation to what God wants to build in this time. The Lord has done this. God has done this. So the sheep that are marked for slaughter become the foundation. Nobody knows what to do with them. But they become the foundation, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore, I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on this stone will be broken to pieces. Now, remember, it's jagged. It doesn't fit in anywhere. It doesn't have an easy spot, and you can trip over it. So it's a stumbling block. So the one who falls on it, the one who stumbles because of it is broken because of it, because they cannot bear the weight of what God is doing. They don't want to accept that this is God, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. So the shepherds who were leading everybody astray in Jesus' time knew he was talking about them, knew that the replacement that the change, that the changing of the guards, that the passing of the torch was here, and that Jesus meant them. So that's where we're at now. And I don't know how long stuff takes. You know, it's like we say the last day started in the church era, and so that's been going on all these years. I don't know how long this particular cycle within that bigger cycle lasts. I don't know how long in the picture of eternity the change happens, but the change is happening. And the change is coming. And so for those who don't seem to have a place, there is a place. There is a place to fit in. Maybe it's not with the traditional churches. Maybe it's not with the traditional shepherds. It's just like I did on Christmas Day where we're closing church because it's Christmas, which that is a whole concept to me that I can't even fathom. We're not having church because it's Christmas, okay? For real, all right? On a Sunday, nonetheless. But I made the point, you're all not having church because you want to go be with your conventional biological family. Well, what about all of us that don't have that? What about all of those who, like Jesus, are shepherd for slaughter, who don't have a place to fit in, who don't have a place to belong? What's supposed to happen to 
all of them. And I said, and maybe if you can't consider us in your church, we need to not go to your church. So what I say is there is place and there is change and the place is to march in the black parade, which has got a war overtone as well as one about death. And so it's a battle cry and it's a rallying place, but that what we do as we move is we march in the black parade. And what I say in closing is the lyrics from it, which like we say are too long, we will play it at the end. Do or die, you'll never make me because the world will never take my heart. Go and try, you'll never break me. We want it all, we want to play a part. I won't explain or say I'm sorry. I'm unashamed, I'm gonna show my scars. Give a cheer for all the broken. Listen here because it's who we are. Just a man, I'm not a hero. Just a boy who had to sing this song. Just a man, I'm not a hero. I don't care. We'll carry on. So the kingdom of God has been taken away from those who turned it into a joke. Who turned it into a game about money. Who took it into a thing for profit at the expense of people. And is going to be given to a people who will bear its fruit who now don't fit in and who really now don't have anywhere to walk but in a black parade. Can you hit the finish button? I can't ever hit the finish button. How come you guys all do it and it's so nice and I go to do it and it doesn't work? Okay.